Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so grateful we get to come into your house tonight. Lord, this is not a have to, this is a get to. Lord, we thank you that we can come into your house openly, freely, gladly. Lord, with lifting up our voices, our hands, and our hearts to you, God. We can praise your name, God. Thank you, Lord, that you overcame, God. We're just so uh, excited to hear from you tonight. Holy Spirit, welcome in this place. Come and be our teacher, be our guide. We didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the brown, the white, the black, any other color we could imagine, God. This is about us coming together and hearing from you. So Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours, Lord. So, God, we ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel Harvest, for Oak Valley, God, for the Well and the Way, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, God. All the great churches that are out there, too many to name, God. Those that are meeting this night, God. And, uh, Father, we just bless them as uh, you bless us, God. Bless our Catholic and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, for the assemblies and the four square denominations. If they're naming Jesus as Lord and preaching his gospel, we bless them. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Amen. Tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Uh, I had mentioned a while back that when I teach on a a night service like this, I'm going to be going through a series. Now, don't worry because tonight's message will stand alone, and I believe that the Spirit of God is going to speak to you tonight. But we've been in a series called The Blessed Life, The Blessed Life out of Matthew, chapter 5. And we're going to read Matthew, chapter 5, verse number 1 through verse number 12. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 1, Jesus is traveling, and it says, seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Now, I want you to notice that, that Jesus, here he is, there's multitudes of people all around, and so Jesus takes his leave, and he he goes up on the side of a mountain, and there on the mountain, his disciples come to him, much like we go to Jesus, much like we search for Jesus, much like we pray, much like we go to church. Why? Because we want to hear from Jesus. His disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. I love that. See, Jesus was waiting for someone to be listening. He's waiting for somebody to be uh, anticipating and expecting to hear from him. And now that he has their attention, he starts to speak and he says these words. He says, blessed, everybody say blessed. Oh, come on, you got to say it like you're happy, all right? Because that's really what the word means. It it means to be envied. It means that congratulations are in order. It means that you have the capacity to succeed. This is not a blessed word. This is a blessed word. So everybody say blessed. blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, right there, all of a sudden, he starts to flip our understanding upside down. We say, well, wait a second. Poor isn't blessed. Rich is blessed, isn't it? Poor isn't blessed, wealthy is blessed, right? No, couldn't, couldn't be that poor in spirit is blessed. Ah, so if he's talking about being poor in spirit, we need to find out what that means. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, For they shall see God. Verse number nine, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, if you remember, let me just remind, remind you of some of the things that we've already said in this series so far. We asked the question, okay, so if blessed means happy, supremely blessed, if it means a condition in which congratulations are in order, if we've got the capacity to succeed when we're blessed, 
What does that mean when we start talking about these things like poor in spirit or hungering and thirsting after righteousness? We ask the question, how to live the blessed life? How do we do it? How do we live the blessed life? If we're going to follow the will and the way of the Lord, this is Jesus speaking, and he's giving us practical things for life, not just spiritual principles, but practical things that we can put into our life. What does it mean to live the blessed life? First thing we learned was to empty your Self. You remember I, I, I highlighted and, and put in big bold letters, self. Empty yourself. In other words, you need to humble yourself. You need to realize that, you know what, I'm not so cool or so smart or so talented or so good or so educated or so wise that I'm anything. I've got to empty myself. I've got to be poor in spirit and humble myself and rely upon the Lord, not upon myself. I'm going to empty myself, right? Second thing we learned is if we're going to live the blessed life, we need to deeply care. That's why he said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. See, we need to mourn over the wrongs that are going on around us. We need to deeply care. We need to be moved enough that when we see reports on the news of things taking place and persecutions around the world, we need to deeply care enough to be moved to pray. We need to be moved to do something, to act, to speak, to, to, to listen and to watch and to wait on the Lord. Also, we need to mourn over our sin. We need to be so grieved when we mess up and when we do something that we know violates the will and the word of God that we will cry, that we will cry out to God, that we will repent and that we'll turn from that wickedness and, and that we will walk in the ways of the Lord. That's why it's blessed because you will be comforted. Next thing we learn, we learn that we need to be readily submitted. Remember he said, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, and, and, and oftentimes we think meek, that kind of sounds like weak, you know, but meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is us being readily submitted. It is the power under control of the Holy Spirit. So when you take the power that you have, even though you could do this, could do that, could bust through, could, could have done this, could have gone over there, no, I'm going to submit myself and the power that I have to the will of the Lord and to the Spirit of God, now you are operating in meekness. You are submitted to the word of the Lord. Number four, last time we're together, we learned this. Number four, how to live the blessed life. Have godly desire. Not just any desire. We got to have a godly desire. There needs to be a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Righteousness not only being the position we have with God, but the practice of God's will and way in our life. And we need to hunger and thirst after that. We need to have a godly desire in our life that motivates us to go after the things of God. Tonight, a couple of more from Matthew, the fifth chapter, let's read it again, verse number seven. Starting out, it says this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Now, most of the other beatitudes, if you will, that's the attitudes we ought to be. That's what they call it in the Latin, the beatitude, the blessings that we're looking at. Most of the other ones I changed, you know, talk about being poor in spirit. I said, empty yourself, that sort of a thing. Now, I was kind of looking at this one and saying, well, be merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. How could I say that any differently? And to be honest with you, I can't. So number five for tonight, be merciful. Plain and simple. Be merciful. See, mercy is not a, a word that we really look at or use that often, even though we should. If I asked you to define mercy, maybe you're like me. I was sitting there trying to define what mercy is. And I had a hard time coming up with words adequate to express what we're talking about when we talk about mercy. Oh, but the moment I say, have you ever received mercy? Now, all of a sudden, we can all say, yeah, yeah, actually, I have. I, I know that. I know what that is. I, I, I can identify what it is. So now we find out that people who have received mercy understand and know what we're talking about. Let me, let me try and express it in words for you. Okay? Mercy is kindness, compassion, it's sympathy. It's getting into someone else's shoes and feeling their pain. That's being merciful. It's not just passive emotion or just pity. This is something that actively desires to comfort and relieve pain. Mercy is expressed. Let's see if you can identify with any of these. Mercy is expressed in forgiveness. 
That's one way that mercy is expressed. We all could say, yeah, I know the, that feeling of mercy because God was merciful to me. I deserved hell. I was a rank sinner. I messed up royally. In fact, I, I was so good at messing up. I, I was the chief of sinners like Paul. And yet, I have obtained mercy. God forgave me. I should have gone to hell. I deserved hell. And yet, the Lord was merciful to me. And when the gavel could have come down and said guilty, it came down on Jesus. And my verdict was not guilty. And now, I've been let free. I have experienced mercy. How else is mercy expressed? Well, mercy is expressed in forbearance. In other words, God patiently waits with us, watches us. Yeah, one thing to mess up before you're a Christian, after you're a Christian, don't you know better? You shouldn't be messing up. What are you doing? And yet here God is patiently waiting for his sons and his daughters to learn of him, to walk with him to grow in Him, to grow up in Him, to mature. And God is forbearing. God is long-suffering, if you will. God is not overlooking or approving of our sin. No, but God is being like a father, that when his child is learning how to walk and they stumble, he doesn't kick them and say, you kid, you're good for nothing. I knew you couldn't walk, and you're never going to walk. No, that's not God. God quietly and gently picks us up and says, don't get ahead of yourself. Come on, let's walk. Let's take one step at a time. Let's move forward. How is mercy expressed? Well, mercy is expressed in kindness. See, there could be somebody on the job that you just want to pop. You know who I'm talking about. You go over to the coffee pot and you hear them talking. And you turn back around and go to the coffee machine instead and look at it and put some buttons. Maybe they won't know that I'm here, right? And yet, mercy can be expressed in just a kind word. Hey, it's good to see you today. You know, they start asking you, how was your weekend? Well, I had a great weekend. I was in church. Oh, church. Well, you know what? I'd love to have you come. Our church would be a great place for you. See, mercy can be expressed in just kindness, kind words, kind actions. What about this? Mercy can be expressed in generosity. See, there's people that don't deserve our time, our talent, our finances. People that don't deserve any sort of expressions of love, but when you operate in generosity, now you are being merciful. Yeah, they don't deserve it, but you know what? I, I, I'm going to bless them anyways. Yeah, you know what? They, 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 they should know better. They should do better, but you know what? I'm going to be generous, and I'm going to sit down and talk to them about this, and we're going to work through this together. See, that's where all of a sudden you start operating in this wonderful mercy of God. You guys know who Mother Teresa is, wonderful saint of God. She said this. She said, I see Jesus in every human being. I say to myself, this is hungry Jesus. I must feed him. This is sick Jesus. This one has leprosy or gangrene. I must wash him and tend to him. I serve because I love Jesus. See, if you don't know how to be merciful, just look at God. The Bible tells us that God is a God of mercy that his mercy endures forever. He's merciful to the evil and the unthankful. That's where the Bible starts to talk about Jesus told the parable. He said God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. See, God showers us with blessings. God gives warmth and sun and rain and, 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 and life to all of us. God is a merciful God. None of us deserve the blessings of God in our life. And yet... God still pours out his mercy on us each and every day. And if you're struggling in life and saying, you know what, God, I don't know how to be merciful, all you have to do is take a look at God. Watch what God did. Look at what Jesus does and then start to do that. You're there in Matthew chapter 5. Turn with me to Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. Everybody doing okay tonight? Praise the Lord. It got a little quiet in here. Matthew chapter number 9. Jesus has just called Matthew, the tax collector, told him to come and follow him. So now Jesus, with his band of men that are following him around, one of his disciples now is a tax collector. And something interesting happens in Matthew chapter number 9, in verse number 10. Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 10, it says, Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors... And, what's that next word? Sinners. Came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, I got to stop right there for a second because maybe some of you don't understand why this is so significant. A tax collector in those days was not collecting taxes for the Jewish state. 
A tax collector in those days was collecting taxes for the Roman Empire, who was occupying the territory at that time. Now, what the Romans did, they were very wise, is that they would employ people of the nationality of the territory that they were in. So these tax collectors that the Bible is talking about are Jewish people who have now gone to the other side. In other words, they are viewed as traitors. They turn their back on their own people, and now they're with the Gentile, and they would often call them the Gentile dogs. It was a put down. They did not like dogs. Dogs ate off the ground. Dogs were, you know, not viewed as something very nice. They didn't like dogs. And so those Gentile dogs. So here's a tax collector in Jesus' group. And now Jesus sits down at the house and because he's got a tax collector, well, the tax collector says, hey, I got a whole lot of tax collector friends. Guess what? We're eating at miles. We're going to have some dinner. Now, all of a sudden, the tax collector say, well, wait a second. Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, the, this, this great man who we've heard about, he, he's got a tax collector in his group. He must be cool, right? And so all of a sudden, all the tax collectors start gathering. Well, with the tax collectors, they weren't very liked people. So with the tax collectors came sinners, and the sinner just said, well, wait, if the tax collectors, these people who are hated, can go be with Jesus, then we can be with Jesus too. They came and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, anytime somebody starts to get any sort of popularity, any crowd gathers around them, somebody starts to rise up, the people that think they're cool and think that they've got it all going on start to notice that they don't like it very much. Why? Because the attention's off them. They love the praises of man. And so, therefore, here's Jesus. Groups of people are gathering to him. They start looking at him. And look at what happens in verse number 11. And when the Pharisees, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of that day, they held to the strictest form of the religious law. In other words, when they looked in the, the Bible the, that they had at that time, the first five books of the Bible, they would look at that and they would hold to those laws. And then they had additional laws that they added on top of that. And so they were so strict, they thought that they were so cool with God. So when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, if he's so good, if he's a rabbi, a teacher, a Jewish rabbi, if he's a part of us, then why is he sitting with the traitors and the sinners? Love verse number 12. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, in other words, you're going to talk to my disciples in my hearing? I'm not deaf, y'all. Okay, well, let, let's talk now. So Jesus, when he heard it, and I love Jesus, just confronts issues. He just goes after it. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. See, we all understand that. We all know that. That's why Jesus came. He came as somebody who was on mission. He came to seek and save the lost, not the found. He came to seek and save the lost. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So he acknowledges these people that are around him, the tax collectors and the sinners, these people are sick, and they need me. Verse 13, so what does he tell the religious leaders? These are people who knew the word, they had the word memorized, they could quote it, they could sing it, they could debate it, they were teachers in Israel, and look at what he says, go and learn. Now all of a sudden he slaps them in the face basically. Listen guys, go and learn this, you who think you're so smart. Learn what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, Jesus is saying something to all of us, that we need to learn what this means. See, it, it, it's easy in church to get into church and get your life cleaned up, and maybe you came off the street, maybe you came off drugs, maybe you came off an addiction, maybe you came out of a bad relationship or a bad background, maybe you were born on the wrong side of the tracks, and then you start getting into church, you get your life cleaned up. Start getting things straightened out. You start, you know, getting your life in order. You start being a good steward. You start driving the right car, wearing the right clothes, that sort of a thing. You're all of a sudden talking the right talk in church. And then when you see people that were in the same position you were in, we can turn around and judge them and say, oh, look at those sinners out there. Look at what they're doing. But God is saying, no, learn this. Learn this. Learn this. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In other words, it's not about the religious ritual that covers you. It's about the mercy. You don't deserve it, but guess what? I'm going to give it to you. This is not based on you. This is based on me. I see your pain, and I'm going to get into the pain with you, and I'm going to relieve it for you. That's what mercy is all about. 
So how does this look in the church today? Glad you asked that question. Colossians chapter 3. Turn there with me. Colossians. If you keep going towards the back, you'll find Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. You can take a, two, take a look at two verses, verse number 12 and verse number 13. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12 starts out and says this, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. Everybody say, put on. put on. See, this is a choice that we have to choose every day. Just like we put on our pants one leg at a time, we put on our shoes, we put on our shirts, put on our hats, whatever it is, put on the dog, put on your makeup, put on whatever, Right? God says, I want you to put on something as, as the elect of God, holy and beloved children. Put on tender mercies. Oh, goodness. Just put them on. Put on tender. Allow yourself to be touched with the pain of others. Allow yourself to be like Jesus, who when he saw the children of Israel like sheep without a shepherd, cried over. When he saw Jerusalem in pain, he cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you together as chicks under my wings. See, there was tender mercies. There was, a, 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 if you will, a motherly heart. You know, men, sometimes we're a little pig-headed, and, 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 you know, we see our kid fall, and we go, get up, kid. Dust it off. Come on, rub some dirt in it and walk it off. What's mom do when she sees the kid fall? Oh, <laughs> you know, and she gets in there and cries with him. See, God is telling us to put on tender mercies. To not just see something and be cold and sterile and not allow it to touch us. God is saying, I want you to take on, I want you when you see the pain and the plight of others to be moved with it. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, that strength under control, long suffering. You know, he's talking about dealing with people, don't you? He's talking about your husband. He's talking about your wife. Put these things on. See, there can be arguments in the home. Why? Because we haven't put these things on. We haven't put on tender mercies. We haven't seen the pain of our spouse and how when we act, they react. We haven't seen that. We've had a wall up. We've been wrapped in our own pain. Well, I'm mad because you said this. I, I'm, I'm angry because you did that. With our children, it's easy to just rumble through and to say, you know what? You just do what I say and that's just how it is. You don't do it, man. Nah, you know? And yet it says, put on tender mercies, kindness. We need to be kind to one another. We need to be tender with one another. We need to walk in humility. I'm so dependent on God. It's not about me. I'm not lifting myself up. I'm lifting God up. Meekness, long suffering. Be patient with your brother and your sister. Now look at the next verse, verse number 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Look at this. If anyone has a complaint against another... Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. That's a good rule of thumb for forgiveness, isn't it? As Christ, so also I must do. So, Lord, wait a second, wait a second. They keep doing it. They haven't got it yet, God. They, they keep messing up, you know, and, and, and fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Right, God? As Christ. But wait a second, God, wait a second. You don't know what they did. Oh, yeah, I do. I know right where they're at, and I know what you did too. How much did Christ forgive you? See, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. How far does the forgiveness of Christ go? How deep? How wide? How high? How great is the forgiveness of See, Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sin. Jesus saw us in a state, and he saw our plight, and he saw our pain. And Jesus took that upon himself, and he felt us. And yet he comes with tender mercies, comes with open heart and open hands, and he lays down his life for us and forgives us. Why? So we could be with him. I, I think, church, I think we're missing out on some amazing relationships because we have not allowed forgiveness to flow in our lives. I think we're missing out on some amazing experiences in the heart of the Father because we have not allowed forgiveness to flow. Now, what's the blessing of being merciful? The blessing of being merciful, if you want to turn back with me to Matthew chapter number 5, kind of cool. Because really, the blessing of being merciful, verse number 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. 
In other words, this is something that as you sow it into other people, you're going to receive it back. And how many of you know there are times in life where you can be strong enough to feel someone else's pain? You can be strong enough to be forgiven. You can be strong enough to overlook an offense. You can be strong enough to be generous. You can be strong enough to be kind. But there are times in our life when you need mercy. Times where you blew it. Times where you were at the end of your rope. Times where you were at the end of your means. Times where you didn't have enough. You couldn't say enough. You couldn't be smart enough. It just wasn't going to make it. And you were in need of mercy. I've got good news for you. What you sow, you shall reap. And God says, blessed, happy, to be envied. Congratulations are in order. Why? Because you've been merciful. And now you will receive the same in your life. The mercies of God and the mercies of man. Isn't that awesome? God is telling us, you're blessed when you extend that mercy. Next one for tonight, there in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 8. Look at it with me. It says, blessed. Everybody say blessed. Blessed Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, this one I did kind of give ourselves a, a little understanding. How do you do this? What's this all about? Blessed are the pure in heart. Number six for tonight is this. Clean inside. Clean inside inside, pure in heart. Now, when you think of something that's pure, you think of something that's unpolluted. Now, not only does this word really mean pure in heart to be unpolluted, you know, it's not just talking about, you know, if you think about a glass of water, let's say I had a glass of water and I had some food coloring, and if I took that food coloring and I started to drop it in that water, as much as I drop in that water, it's going to pollute that water, it's going to change that water's color. Now, all of a sudden, it's not pure any longer. If I take sugar and I add that to the water and I start to stir it around, what's happening? You, you, you may not see it, but it's polluted now. There's something else in there. There's a mixture going on. So really, what it's talking about is not just unpolluted, but also undivided. It is a whole heart. It is a pure heart. There's no mixture. There's nothing inside taking you away from your focus and your motive. You are wholly, totally fixed in heart on God. That's what it means to be pure in heart. Unpolluted. You're not allowing anything else in. You're not allowing things in that shouldn't be there. But also undivided. That you are 100% wholehearted on God. If you think about that same cup, right? Think about that same cup. If I had that cup and I had sugar and I had food coloring mixed in there, you know what's a way to clean that out? I could dump that out. I could wash it out, you know, start over again. Or I could put that under the flow of water. Is that right? If there was a flow of water, what would happen? Pretty soon, the other parts would get washed out of that cup and would start to purify. Why? Because there's a washing going on. There's a cleansing going on. We'll come back to that. I want you to think, okay, a lot of imagination tonight. Is this cool with everybody? You guys got your, your imagination going here? Think about a, a big oak tree, okay? Some of you guys have been down. Uh, I live in Redlands, and there's the, the park across from the university. A lot of big oak trees. Think about if you were walking through the oak trees one day, and, and all of a sudden you came up, and there was an oak tree laid over on its side, completely toppled over. And the night before, there was a windstorm, but you thought, man, it wasn't really that bad. What's going on with this oak tree? And as you walked up to that oak tree, you started to look at it, and you saw splintered halves, you know, there, and you looked around, and the the leaves were still green, things were still looking good all the way around. But then you walked to the base of that tree where it had splintered off, and you looked to see if maybe somebody had used a tool on it, maybe they they chopped it, maybe they they had had sawn it or something like that. And you start to look, and you don't see any signs of that. It's real splintered. It looks like it just toppled over. Well, you wouldn't really know from the outside what happened to that tree. But if you walked around the base of that trunk and you looked into the tree, all of a sudden you would see what happened. There were little beetles in there, little bark beetles that had got inside, underneath the surface. And they had started to eat out. And it started to kill the tree on the inside. And now rot had set in after so much time of being dead in that area. And that rot continued to move through the inside of that tree. And now when even a small little gust of wind came, all of a sudden that tree no longer had the strength to stand. And it splinters and it topples over. Why? Because it wasn't healthy on the inside. That's why Jesus comes along and he says to all of us, Blessed are the pure in heart. Why? Because what's going on on the inside ultimately will affect your entire person. See, the heart is the central part of who you are. 
It's the, the place where your spirit man lives. It's the seat of your mind, your will, your emotions. And it's that place where your spirit and soul link up and follow the things of God. And if you are pure in heart, then you will have a healthy heart. If you are pure in heart, then you will have a strong heart for the things of God. But if you have a polluted or if you have a divided heart, you're going to be sick on the inside. And even though on the outside you may look cool, maybe going to church, maybe doing all the right things, amen, brother, hallelujah, praise the Lord, right? But if you're sick on the inside, it won't be long before you're not able to stand any longer. And that's why God comes and he says, I want you to do work on the inside. You're there in Matthew, turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. Is this helping anybody tonight? Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, God lists a bunch of promises. I will be amongst the people. They will be my people. I shall be their God. I'll be a father to them. They'll be my sons and daughters. God's giving all these promises out. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 comes along and he says this, Therefore, having these promises... In other words, God has given us promises. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's a promise. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. I'll walk among you if you are holy. That's a promise. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us. Everybody say let us. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What is he saying? He says, perfecting. See, if you're perfecting something, that means that you're going from one place to another. You're, you're getting better at it. You're growing in that area. In our walk with God, we need to continually be pursuing that perfecting of holiness. Why? Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord, the Bible says. And therefore, it's important that we are pure in heart so that we can see God. So how do we do this? Look at, let us cleanse ourselves. I want you to notice it didn't say, make God cleanse you. See, because on the cross, Jesus took care of the sin issue in your life. He cleaned you up. And spiritually, you are brand new. You are born again. But the problem is, in this life, is that we still live in these earth suits. We still live in these fleshly bodies. And our mind has to be renewed. So our spirit is renewed. Our mind is being renewed. And our bodies will be renewed when Jesus comes or when we go to be with him. We'll get a new body, new tent, no sin. I can't wait for that day. My goodness, it's going to be a great day. But until then, I have to live in this, this flesh. I have to live in this earth suit. And therefore, this earth suit doesn't want to do what the spirit man wants to do. There's a war going on inside. And so we have to work at this. How does that happen? Pure of heart. You start getting yourself unpolluted. You don't allow things in. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to put that in. Listen, I've watched enough murder. I've watched enough adultery. I've watched enough impurity. I've seen enough in life. I don't need to see anymore. I don't need to go and see that old filthy movie. I don't need to put money into the pockets of people who are going to continue to produce filth and push their agenda on me and my children. I'm not going there. I'm going to watch a good godly movie. I'm going to watch a good godly show. Listen, I'm not going to listen to that, that old radio station bumping and doing all this and putting all this nastiness in my mind. I'm not going to allow that in. Why? Because you can't just listen to the beats, church. You will know the words if you listen to the beats. That's how music is designed. We get it in us. We learned our ABCs through song. So what are you putting in? See, if you can keep yourself unpolluted, stay unspotted, pure and undefiled religion before God is this, to take care of the widows and orphans, be merciful, and to keep yourself undefiled from the world. See, you got to stay away. The world is messy. The world is splattered. They're out there playing in the mud, and you cannot hang around the mud hole without falling in. So you got to keep yourself pure. you got to keep yourself away. Maybe it's time to cut off some old relationships, some old friendships, some old things that are dragging you down and keep yourself pure. But also keep yourself undivided. I'm not going to allow my attention to go to sports, even though sports are cool and fun and we like them. Hey, that's good. Physical exercise profits a little, 
But I'm not going to let that little prophet take over my, my greatness in my relationship with God. I am wholehearted. You know what? This day is for church. I, I'm going to get into church more than one time a week. I'm going to go forward in my walk with God. I'm going to learn everything I can learn. I'm going to pray until I can't pray no more. I'm going to just keep open communication with God. I am wholehearted 100%. If I'm on the job, I'm working hard for Jesus, right? And, and, and if I'm at home, I'm taking care of my family with God in the mix. God is in the middle. God is at the center. God is my everything. See, that is a pure heart before the Lord. Now, the cleansing agent, if we're going to cleanse ourselves, if it says, let us, let us, well, how do I do that? Let us. Well, I've given you some things, but really the agent that we see in the Word of God is the Word of God. Oh, yeah. You can see that in the Bible. Jesus said, the Word which I have spoken to you has already made you clean in John the 15th chapter. Wow. Wow. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, talking about marriage, it says that Jesus is presenting to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, by the washing of the water of the word. The word of God, as you renew your mind, will clean you up from the inside out. It is that flow, that fountain of water that I was talking about. When you hold your cup underneath that fountain of water, it's going to go in and it will push out the impurities and it will make you clean from the inside to the outside. Are you listening, church? The other cleansing agent that we find in the Word of God is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. First John chapter 1, verse 9, I would suggest you put it to memory because we all need this verse in our life that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, as you confess your sin and put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you were holding something in your hand and you put it under the blood, when you pulled your hand out, it would no longer be there. You'd be white as snow, unspotted from that thing. See, those are the cleansing agents, but the responsibility lies in us. We have to get the word of God. We have to put ourselves under submission to this fountain. We have to get the rivers of living water flowing in our lives. We have to go under this. We have to confess. We have to abstain. We have to close. We have to, you know, shun. We have to, to run from evil. Flee from that which is evil, the Bible says. Flee youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, peace, and love with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, when we do these things, we receive the wonderful promise that blessed are the pure in heart. Why? For they shall see God. There's a verse that I'm sure none of you have ever read in the past month in the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 22. You want to turn there with me? Because I know it's going to be the first time you're seeing it. Some of you guys are wondering why I'm making that joke. is because we've been in this verse for like the last month and a half, something like that. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 22. Look at what it says. Let us draw near. See, I could have gone to a lot of verses. Old Testament. Let's try the Old Testament. We could have gone, Lord, who can ascend your holy hill? Who can, who can dwell in your mountain, God? He who has pure heart, clean hands. See, tons of verses throughout the Bible, but I thought this one was perfect for what we're talking about tonight. Let us draw near. See, we're going into the presence of God. How do we approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water? Blessed are the pure in heart. Why? Because they now can draw near to God, cleansed and now given access to the very presence of God. Now, we don't see God physically until we go and be with him and we get eyes that can handle that. See, no flesh can stay in his presence because we're sinful. We can't see God and live. But God says, you shall see God if you're pure in heart. That's a here and now. That's a, that's a present reality. How do we see God? We see God by the eyes of faith. Now, all of a sudden, it's no longer that I don't see God anymore. No, now, all of a sudden, as you're pure in heart, you start to see God everywhere and in everything. See, as you start to be pure in heart, you shall see God. How? See God as Father. See God as faithful. See God as friend. How will you see God? You'll see him at work, and you'll see him at home. How will you see God? You'll see him in church, and you'll see him on the street. How will you see God? You'll see him in the calm, and you will see him in the storm. Everywhere and every way, you will see God in all things in life. And now, all of a sudden, you will be living in the presence of God. Where God's presence is, there is his power. Now, because of what God has done and who he is, who you are in him, now you can live the blessed life, happy 
and to be envied. What did we learn tonight? We learned two things. We learned, number one, be merciful. Extend yourself. Go and feel the pain of others and extend the same mercy and kindness that's been given to you. Secondly, what did we learn? We learned we need to clean inside. Get ourselves pure in heart. Why? Because there's a great promise that as we're merciful, we will be shown mercy. And as we're pure in heart, we will see God. Did you guys get something from the word of the Lord today? <laughs> Praise God. Hey, you guys have been awesome tonight. I want to thank you guys. I really do believe you got something from the word of the Lord. Let's talk and uh, I want to talk about your eternal life. I want to talk about where you're at with God. See, a lot of times people come into church and we let them go and not even wonder what's going to happen. Many times, American churches, people in American church think, well, you know, if you just go to church, you've got to be a Christian because that's why you showed up. The problem is, you know that nowhere in the Bible to say you can sit in church service and call yourself a Christian? That makes you a Christian. It's like saying I could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, sit in the dugout, wear the uniform, bring my bat and my ball, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and mock me up. Why? Because I'm not a part of the Dodgers organization. And did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. So what does it take to get to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, you got to be good to get to heaven. I, I think if you're just good enough, God will see that and he'll let you into heaven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say how good you have to be? You know, because I, I know us in our human nature, you know, just be this good or, you know, do a lot of good deeds or whatever, you know, and we'll, we'll do the minimum amount to get into heaven. There's no grading scale. There's no curve. There's no line that you have to be above. You can't just be your good outweighs your bad or you do enough good deeds or get involved in social justice or that sort of a thing. And God sees that and appreciates that and lets you into heaven. In fact, if you read your Bible, you'll find out you can't be good enough to get to heaven because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it there based on your own merit. You can't be good enough to get to heaven. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me you were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized your Christian as a child? You went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class or, you know, Sabbath school class. And, and, and you were baptized or christened. Born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. We're Christians, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible just say you can attend enough church, be raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian? You know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, because you go to religious classes, because you're baptized or christened or born in America, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God loves you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. It's not there. Sometimes people say, well, I get that, Pastor, but you know, I, my last church I got involved. I sang in the choir for a number of years, helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader and got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Can you just show that to me in the Bible? Will you help out, make decisions? People think of you as a leader, you sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible. You get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible say your church involved and gets you to heaven. And I don't see God waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. It simply doesn't work like that. You say, but pastor, hold on. I know God. I, I celebrate Easter and Christmas every year of my life. I can quote scriptures to you. That's great. I'm glad you could do this thing. If you read your Bible, you know demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you'd know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God, but rather this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Jesus came to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. And they were talking about this very same thing in John, the third chapter. You can read about it. And as Jesus was speaking to this religious leader, this guy was a Pharisee. Remember the Pharisees? This guy held to the strictest form of the religious law. If we would have thought anybody was going to heaven, we would have thought it was Nicodemus. Why? Because he was raised up in his church. He did a lot of good deeds. He, he became one of the people that were involved in his church and, and actually got into leadership. He could teach other people about Jesus, or, uh, sorry, about God, and they could find out about the things of God from him and the scriptures. He could quote them. He could sing them. He could debate them. My goodness, when he gave his money, they blew trumpets at the temple. And yet, a guy who's got all this stuff going for him, Jesus doesn't look at him and say, Nick, man, hey, 
you're cool. Keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to be headed for heaven? You want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know sometimes people turn off when I say be born again, but listen, that's a Bible phrase. That's not something from the world that the movies dragged up. That's not a, 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 a cuss or a, 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 you know, any sort of put down that they made up. It's not about what Hollywood and television and movies and the internet say. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. What's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, it's your call, your choice. I'm going to count to three and go like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's push past that tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you're that dumb. That's why he's trying to push you out of this tonight. Listen, I love you and God loves you so much. So I'm trying to push you towards this. But ultimately, it's your decision. It's your call. You can sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or you can take this opportunity to simply raise your hand. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online. Come on, get ready to get your hand up. God sees you, God's watching. If you're on campus, you can tell an usher, come in to the church service right afterwards. If you're online, you can click the blue button that says respond to God or go to our homepage where it says how to know God. Someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. If you need to do this, get ready to get your hand up. All together on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Who else tonight? Two wise people already. Three, thank you. Four, God bless you. Who else tonight? You're saying, I I need to give God all my heart all my life. Five, got you. God bless you. Six, up on top over there. Seven, got you over here. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? About seven wise people. I I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. I got you over there. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Got you. Oh, thank you. Thank you right there. Eight, eight wise people already. Anybody else real quick? Need to give God all your heart? Need to give God all of your life? Where you at, number eight? Number nine, number 10, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, yeah, come on, you should do this. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. If you're sitting there and you're saying, yeah, I know that I was kind of sitting there. God's tugging at your heart. You can feel that pull. Come on, let's just respond to God right now. Acknowledging your need for Jesus, just raising your hand right now. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, I'm gonna close this up in a moment. Don't miss this opportunity if that's you. Just pop your hand up and I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for about eight wise people. Hallelujah. So cool. All right, all eight of you, or if you're number nine, number 10, number 11, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, it's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend, whatever you brought with you to church, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. Can't do that until we get you down here. So if that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Let's all stand and welcome them. And you come. Just make your way to the front right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. You're all my life. You're all I need.
They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Take all these pieces to mend and to keep. If your child raised their hand, you can bring them right now. They're welcome. Come on down. They'll remember this. You need to come. From the family rooms, you're welcome to come with your children. Come on down. They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. So take all these pieces to mend and to They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. Take a look down inside and see what you see. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. From the deepest part of me. All right, all right. Everybody up front, look up here for a second. Take a look up here. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Okay, right over here to my right, your left. See this man in black over here? This is Pastor Joel. He's a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on, okay? You know, you see a man in black, you wonder, what's up? He's cool, all right? He's going to do three things with you. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again from this moment on, all right? brand new on the inside. Now you need to find out what to do next. So secondly, he's going to give you some free stuff. We all love free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. That's a good relationship already, okay? So he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? Then thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. What is that? Well, it's basically a friend in church. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym? Helps you get strong, get buff, just like me, okay? I don't know why they're laughing, but anyways, a spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually, okay? It's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm gonna turn from sin and I'm gonna turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.